All right, well, welcome back. Um, interesting in putting together the cyber panel and the critical infrastructure panel in the way the disciplines are slowly evolving and slowly harder and harder to separate. I mean, when you think about it, what we heard earlier, you know, everything that used to be analog is now digital, and we heard uh, uh, Richard talking about um, the, uh, uh, the electric grid now and SCADA systems being all controlled by digital computers. So we, ha and, and we heard about uh, Darren talking about how the NRC now and all the, the power plants are now controlled by information technology. You know, if you go back years, you would think cybersecurity, people tended to think about the information technology segment. But what we heard in that last panel is when you talk about cybersecurity, it cuts across every segment of our, of our country in all these various uh, different areas. So today, uh, we're focused on um, critical infrastructure protection. We're going to drill down a little bit closer on that electric grid. I mean, can you imagine something like unimaginable like the power going out at a Super Bowl or something I mean you know we just can't can't have something like that in our uh, but anyway uh, as always I am going to introduce the moderator who in turn will introduce the panelists and run the show uh, many of you know Jim Payne he is now the president of the public sector for ZNA Infotech which is an 8a company that is focused on cybersecurity um, many of us know Jim from prior jobs. He's, he was at Telcordia. He's a longtime member of the community in the IT and telecommunications industry. And he served on such things as the President's Commission on Critical Infrastructure Protection, the Council of Competitiveness, and the President's National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee, many of which uh, I had the opportunity and pleasure to work with Jim in many of those different uh, venues over the years. So with that, uh, we're turning this one over to Mr. Jim Payne, who will uh, lead this panel. Thank you, James. I'm hoping that we'll find this dialogue that we're going to try to stimulate here uh, very uh, interesting and challenging. Certainly, most of us met each other on these various committees that Jim mentioned, um, NSTAC or uh, NSEP uh, related issues as but it was very interesting to us who have been working on critical infrastructure for maybe five or ten years to hear the president reference specifically the power grid in his State of the Union comments in January specifically the vulnerability of the power grid um, I, I wasn't cheerful when I heard that but I thought that's going to be a really interesting tie-in to this panel that's helpful um, and it happens also to be the subject of a white paper that uh, Dan Hurley and I, who I'll introduce in a few minutes, have been working on for maybe the last four or five months. Um, if you're not aware of this, uh, FCA is, is changing the business model to some extent in that they're focusing on very specific committees, some relative to agencies such as DHS, but also others relative to a technology or point of view. So there's a technology panel uh, committee. I'm, I serve with Dan on the cybersecurity committee panel, and about a third of our members are CIOs of executive agencies and intel agencies. And this is one of the problems that was brought to us as a challenge, would we like to assess it? So we're gonna speak a little bit more of that. So what I'd like to do, and I asked the panel to sit in alphabetical order, remember those days in school, so I, my notes match up to theirs. Um, each person is a subject matter expert in the issue of critical infrastructure. So we have the ability to talk from a technical point of view, from a threat uh, prevention point of view, as well as a, a, a mitigation strategy. And you, hopefully you're going to see those comments throughout the panel presentation here. So let me first introduce at the far end, um, Bill Bryan. Uh, Bill is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Infrastructure Security and, and Energy Restoration at DOE. So obviously this is a core issue for him. His office works with the national security staff and other government agencies to essentially work with the international partners to figure out what do we do in the event of one of these enormous crises, right? Um, before assuming his current position, he served as the Director of Critical Infrastructure Protection at the Department of Defense. So Bill is eminently qualified to speak on the public policy implications of the threat that we're going to brief you on. Steve Flynn, Dr. Flynn, is a professor of political science and the founding co-director 
at the George Casas Research Institute, the Homeland Security, at Northeastern University. So we have a representative from the academic community, which is again a, a model we use on the cyber committee. Many universities are also active on the cyber committee. He served as president of the Center for National Policy and spent a decade as a senior fellow for the National Security Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, senior fellow at Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. So he again, highly qualified to comment on uh, our subject matter this morning, this afternoon. Dan Hurley, um, second in from me. Dan and I go way back on a number of committees, uh, the Way Forward, which was a classified initiative in, in the years past, the uh, NSTAC relationships, the uh, CWPI, uh, the, the programs, uh, enormously involved in critical infrastructure. Dan serves as the Director of Critical Infrastructure Protection at the United States Department of Commerce, NTIA, and a career member of the federal government at the SCS level. Uh, he's played a role in international initiatives by the federal government and U.S. industry to help build capacity in cybersecurity. So again, highly qualified. To my immediate left is uh, Dr. Jeff Mazur. Jeff is a um, semiconductor engineer with the Smart Grid program at the National Institute of Standards and Science and Technology, NIST, in Gaithersburg. The NIST Smart Grid program office is charged with facilitating just this kind of dialogue between the public and private sector. Prior to joining NIST in 2009, Jeff served for 15 years as the in-house technical authority for the photovoltaic technology with the solar energy technologies program at the DOE. So again, highly credentialed. Um, Jeff is the author of a very scholarly book on the subject of photovoltaics and also a contributor to the interagency communication dependency on electric power working group. Again, very much focusing on this and it kind of almost like the perfect storm. All this has come together um, in the context of the comments made in the State of the Union. So what I'd like to do is offer the panelists uh, about 10, 15 minutes to make some comments. And the reason I'm starting with uh, Dan Hurley is Dan is going to present in a very concise um, presentation the results of the white paper that the Cyber Committee has been working on. And the particular it concern, I don't want to steal your thunder, Dan, is the transformers that under current conditions take 12 to 24 months to replace these components which can weigh as much as 400 tons. And when you try to move that kind of mass to the highway systems, the railroad systems, it takes an enormous amount of coordination. Good news is there's mitigations that we think could be successful if it is invested in. I'm going to ask Dan to start off with kind of laying that groundwork. Dan? Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Risk mitigation in the electric power sector. Serious attention needed. That's actually the title of a paper prepared by the subcommittee that Jim Payne has just uh, mentioned. The three aspects derive from recommendations selected from that communications dependency on electric power study that was completed in 2009. That study, and Dr. Mazur was on the working group with me, compiled approximately 47 recommendations. The top 10 were included in the executive summary, and this subcommittee selected three of those top 10 recommendations because they each deal with a little bit different aspect. One of them deals with equipment, one of them deals with human interaction, and the third deals with technology. So we thought it made sense to look and see what might have happened in connection with those recommendations made back early in 2009, almost four years ago. Some of the information is good, some of the information is not so good. The papers, rec it highlights the risk that's inherent in the electric power grid, and it will report on mitigation efforts where they have occurred. Next slide, please. Transmission transformers are one part of uh, three components in a regular electric power grid. You've got the generation facilities, nuclear, hydroelectric, fossil fuels, etc. 
you have the mechanism where the voltage coming out of the power plant is stepped up to extra high voltage so it can be transmitted a long distance to distant locations. It's that component that we're talking about and focusing our attention, the transmission component. And that's not to be confused with the distribution transformers that we find in our neighborhoods that step the voltage down to be used in homes and businesses. As you might imagine, the generation facilities are well protected. They take a long time to build, but they're highly protected. Less protected and fewer in number are the, gen are the transmission transformers. And uh, the lead time for replacement uh, is still, Jim, about 18 to 24 months. We'd like to get it down to 12 months. But what happened was when the electric grid in the United States expanded significantly in the 50s and 60s, they built these transmission transformers all across the country. The companies that made this stuff, they didn't have any more to sell. Some of them went out of business, they consolidated. Some of them went offshore. Now, 50 or 60 years later, they have reached the end of their extended life and we need, now need to figure out a way to get transmission transformers back. And to get them overseas, it takes 18 to 24 months. There are three approaches to dealing with the transmission transformer issue. And we assert, and we give visibility here today, that they are complementary, not in contention or competition with one another. And I believe our panelists We'll talk a little bit more about the STEP program and the RECX program, but I just want to real quickly summarize that. Spare transformer equipment program came into being right after 9-11, and it resulted from an effort by the Edison Electric Institute with industry to form consortiums to share a designated transformer among each company that participated in the consortium. It's limited by scope to respond to a terrorist attack on a transmission transformer, and it requires a presidential declaration. So it's a good initial effort, but it's narrow in scope and a high hurdle to make use of it. About, nine, about 2006, the Department of Homeland Security began looking into developing a modular approach to having transmission transformers, the type that you could pack them up on a convoy of trucks and take them someplace. In that sense, what the Department of Homeland Security and EPRI, which was the co-sponsor, had in mind was something analogous to what AT&T has with their national disaster recovery effort around the United States in four locations, our yards, where AT&T has on trucks different components that are a switch for a large building. And so DHS's RECX effort, they call it, is intended to be analogous to that. We'll, we'll hear more about that. And one other initiative we learned about during this update deals with the NERC, the North American Electric Recovery Corporation. And NERC is has established something called the Spare Parts in the e Effort, SPE. That's intended to have companies come together on a volunteer basis and identify, they know what equipment they might be willing to share. They have a spare equipment database that would allow equipment to come through and be shared anonymously. So it's broader in scope. It doesn't, re not restricted to terrorist activity, does not require a presidential declaration but it's sufficiently new that it hasn't gotten much visibility and take up. So among this white paper's recommendations are to try to give more visibility to NERC's spare parts effort. The second aspect deals with human interaction. We found that within the electric power sector and the communication sector, there are a lot of really good situation awareness tools. And because the communication sector is sort of organized nationally top down, 
whereas the electric power sector is organized locally, bottom up, the place where they had the greatest likelihood of interacting was at the level of a state emergency operations center. And much as I used to do aboard ship, where if I had a signal, a radar signal, I would check and see if any of my analysts had a signals intelligence communication signal just to get a separate line of bearing on an issue. At an emergency operations center, if an analyst in the communications industry sees some indication of a problem, they might share it with the analyst from the electric power sector to see if they would be able to identify a problem early and begin working on it. Unfortunately, this initiative, after the report complete was completed, uh, they had discussions for about two years, and ultimately it was allowed to sort of die with the conclusion that, well, to identify this as a problem means we've solved it and we don't have to do anything more. It reminded me of what the mathematicians used to write down when you get to a certain part in a proof of a theorem, they would simply write QED, quid erat demonstratum, what, which has been demonstrated from here. And that was really where the computations got tough. So I find it interesting that uh, the Department of Homeland Security, which commissioned this earlier study, would simply say, well, to identify the problem means we've solved it. The, the third area deals with technology. And as backup energy, we're familiar with diesel and natural gas generators, but that requires refueling often into very restricted areas. And so one of the first persons I called to join the Communications Dependency and Electric Power Working Group was Dr. Mazur, who was a photovoltaics expert, because we wanted to look into the issue of using renewables at certain critical nodes within other critical infrastructure sectors. You may not realize it, but the electric power sector has an own internal non-commercial telephone system, which allows at a company, at a regional, and a grid level to balance load and what the supply of energy is. We have suggested in that earlier 2009 report, and we reiterate that suggestion, that the communications industry and other critical infrastructures consider their own inherent indigenous ability for electric power. The study deals separately with other findings and recommendations, and I think what I will do is answer in the follow-up questions some of our findings, and you've already heard some of our recommendations with respect to those three principal recommendations we selected to look at for a four-year historical perspective. And I think I'll conclude at this point. Yeah, well, thank you, Dan. So Dan's kind of laid a baseline that speaks to an aging infrastructure in the 50 or 60 year since they were installed. Uh, expected life to expect life expected about a 30 year so many of them are at the very end of that life cycle not many alternatives here in the United States and yet a, a long lead time Bill I'm going to ask you to start the discussion on the policy side since one of the areas of concentration of energy is just these issues so give us your thoughts on that bill sure. uh, first uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here today uh, for the invitation to speak and also I thank all of you for hanging in there you are the true faithful to be at the last session of a day before uh, some kind of reception tonight I understand so thank you for sticking around and being part of the afternoon session um, I did have the privilege of uh, uh, during Sandy uh, to join Rich Serino from FEMA uh, Major General Walt Davis from Northcom uh, to be part of a senior level team that was actually out in the field the first 10 days uh, that the storm impacted the area so some of my comments I'll be able to draw on some of those experiences as I go through my, uh, my uh, quick presentation here. Uh, first, my uh, brief overarching comments uh, on the white paper is the preliminary findings of the white paper uh, clearly touch on the role of the federal government um, and, and what we're supposed to do in this area, right? They've touched on communications, they touched on integration, they touched on building uh, partnerships, uh, primarily our partnerships with industry, and we have very good partnerships with industry, and also the investment in technologies. And of course, from where I sit, all of that is, is 
wrapped up and addressed in three main areas. Uh, reliability, survivability, and resiliency. And that's how we, at least in our office, see the world. Reliability is what are those things that we can do prior to an event occurring uh, to keep the system reliable and stable. Survivability is how can elements of the system withstand an attack or an event, right? And, and some of that has to do with hardening. Some of that has to do with protection. And yes, there are some nodes that you absolutely want to protect um, and keeping the system reliable. And then the final one is resiliency. How quickly can we recover? So everything we do and all the money that we invest in and the time that we invest is, fits into one of those three categories. And then we integrate those three categories. Uh, but let me give you a, a what if story. What if we knew that without, beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was gonna be a terrorist attack in the United States? And if carried out successfully, and we were pretty reasonably sure that this was going to happen, but if carried out successfully, it would render 100% of our offshore drilling capacity in the southeast stopped. It would render uh, refining 80% of the nation's refining capacity in the southeast stopped. It would kill the electric power of the landmass the size of three states. If we knew this, I could tell you there would be panic. That's exactly what happened. 2005 with Rita and Katrina, right? It wasn't a terrorist attack, it was a natural disaster. And, and two important lessons were learned. Number one, uh, industry learned some things they needed to do because it took four months to recover from that. And, and the, so they implemented some, some, uh, some protection mechanisms, some hardening capabilities. And so when Ike and Katrina hit three years later, they recovered in half the time by adopting some of these lessons learned. Another interesting thing happened the nation took a very different look on how we approach our critical infrastructure in the United States. Right after 9-11, we took a, a position of protection. We did not want terrorists to attack us anymore. And a lot of time and a lot of money, a lot of energy was spent on physical protection, gates, guards, and guns, right? Bio-readers at the at entrances of facilities and, and, and putting in crash barriers and, and on and on and on. None of that worked during Rita Katrina. The money invested by industry to protect their facilities did nothing to predict against a storm. And, and, and they weren't the only ones that recognized this. Uh, so the nation started to look at the concept of resilience. And, and hence PDD 21 recently signed uh, addresses that critical infrastructure resilience as opposed to protection. And I think for the energy sector, resilience is absolutely the right approach. You can't exclude protection. There will always be that time and those assets that need to be protection, to, to need to be protected. But we did go down this path of resiliency as a concept, and I think it's, a, it's the right approach. But we can't exclude, and I talked a lot about natural disasters, frankly, because since 9-11, we've had over 60 major natural disasters, uh, not a terrorist attack of any significance. So you, 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 you know, prepare to fight the war that you're, you're facing with. And, and for the utility industry, that's been natural disasters. But we can't exclude those other threats that are out there. Right? We can't exclude those high-impact, low-frequency events. We can't exclude geomagnetic storms. That's a natural occurring phenomena that could, that could uh, affect our electric grid. We can't exclude cyber. And I know many of you are cyber experts out there and, and recognize that. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of great details. I'm certain you had a lot of uh, meetings and discussions on that already, so I won't uh, go down that path. Uh, but these are things that we are addressing and we are looking at, we are heavily engaged with within the Department of Energy. But I will tell you, it is about managing risk. And in reading the paper, there was a lot of, of uh, emphasis put on industry uh, to, to take some action to make this electric grid more resilient, more reliable, more survivable during an event. Uh, but I gotta tell you, that risk is spread across a whole lot of people and not just the electric industry. If you are an, if you are an individual citizen or a business or a company that performs a critical function, you're part of that. You are assuming risk, right? And, and if you own the function, you have to determine what level of risk you're willing to accept. Um, I noticed that during uh, Sandy, there were a lot of cries out to industry of why did this happen? Well, I can assure you the grid is 99.6% reliable, right? But it really ticks people off at that 0.4%. You know, especially if your hair dryer and microwave doesn't work, right? And, and that's where we're at. The grid is pretty doggone resilient and robust. And we're pretty fortunate. It's aging, yes. It needs to be updated, yes. Uh, but we have to, as, as customers, uh, as people with critical functions, you have to take steps to prepare yourself for those long-term outages 
for those devastating events that, that are going to happen to us. So customers do have a, a role to play in that. And I will tell you, that, not that golf courses are critical, although I look at some of you out there and I would venture to say that you would argue that point. But I was in Pebble Beach uh, last week. Actually, I was driving through Pebble Beach. That wasn't my trip. I was driving through Pebble Beach uh, on that 17-mile drive, and I noticed something. Wherever, you know, all their wiring is underground, their distribution grid is all underground, but where the transformers were above ground, every one of them had a generator. Every one. Obviously, the residents of Pebble Beach do not want to assume any risk of any power outage in Pebble Beach because every one of them had a generator. And those that have been there know what I'm talking about because they're at every one of those boxes. Right? And sometimes that's what we have to do. There were communities during uh, Sandy, small little co-op communities who relied on the investor-owned utilities to provide them power that were able to get their distribution grid up and running. And the only way they were able to power themselves because the investor-owned utility had other bigger things they were worrying about. They were actually able to bring in mobile generation, drop a line from their distribution grid and plug in to mobile, mobile generators to power their distribution grid within their small communities. So people are getting very creative, and that's just one step of some of the things people are doing to, take, uh, to, to prepare for these kind of events in the future. Public utility commissioners, right? They provide cost recovery for utilities, so they have a role in this risk. Regional transmission operators uh, have a role to play. State and local governments, when it comes to siting and permitting, you know, we could have a lot of great ideas that industry needs to take to make the grid more reliable, more resilient, more redundant, so on and so forth but there are a whole lot of other players in that mix that need to be brought together. And, and frankly, over the last year and a half to two years, there's been a big push to educate those other pieces of the community, the industry community, that really didn't have insight into the vulnerabilities of the grid and the th current threats facing our grid. So more and more of them have been getting involved. A lot of discussion on transformers. Uh, the good news is two years ago, we weren't making any, and now we are. Uh, we are manufacturing large-scale transformers again in the United States, and there are other companies coming in to do this. All right, that's a good news story. Um, you've heard about the recovery transformer, the, uh, the RecX uh, effort with the uh, Department of Homeland Security, S&T, and, and EPRI. Um, we are very, we at the Department of Energy are very pleased with that. There's obvious, obviously some skeptics in industry about jumping on board with this. You know, transformers are designed to be efficient for a particular, uh, for a particular piece of the grid. Um, and so there's always worry about this efficiency issue, uh, but by all measures and accounts, at least now, the testing data coming in is this thing is very efficient, very efficient. Uh, more to follow, right? Um, but uh, you've heard about the STEP program. You know, right now there are 50 utilities involved in the STEP program. That's 70% of the members of uh, FERC's jurisdictional transmission system are represented in the STEP program. Right. They, they are required to have so many transformers on hand. And they are also required to sell those transformers to those in need that lose them, as, as was stated earlier, uh, in, is in response to a terrorist attack and a national declaration of emergency from the president. Uh, so those kind of things are happening. You heard about the spare parts database from NERC. I will also tell you that um, um, in, in meeting with some of the transformer manufacturers, you know, we talked about this 18 to 24 month lead time for transformers. You know, a transformer, a large-scale transformer, will cost anywhere from six to ten million dollars, right? Somewhere in that range. For an investment of about five hundred thousand dollars by the utility, they could probably have a large-scale transformer in four months, right? What takes the time is the engineering design and drawings. What takes the time is manufacturing the windings that go in these transformers, right? All these things take time. These are the long lead items. And if, if a company knew, suspected, and we're working at developing some technology to monitor the, 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 uh, the age of these transformers to see when they're, when they're about ready to end their life, right? They could then put these orders in for these large-scale transformers well in advance, get the engineering done, order their, their, the, uh, the windings in, in these transformers. They could be on the side. And then when they actually need them, they could be put together, manufactured, and on site realistically in about four months. So there are some steps that the transformer manufacturers are taking to try to speed this process up. Uh, so if we are hit with a catastrophic event, now granted, you need manufacturers to make those in that time, and we're growing that, but there are some things that, steps that are being taken now to try to shorten that timeline up uh, as best we can. Uh, the paper also addressed situational tools. 
Um, I know within the Department of Energy, uh, we have what we call Eagle Eye. It's the Environment for Analysis and Geolocated Energy Information. Um, we do, we are able to see in real time, near real time, um, the distribution system of the grid in the United States, clear down to the distribution level. We have about 70% visibility uh, in the Eastern Interconnect, about 50% visibility in the Western Interconnect, uh, and about 85 to 90% in ERCOT. And we are working to grow that and, and fill in those gaps um, on that visibility. And, and that database is available uh, to uh, government entities, state, federal government entities, and also available to the utilities that are providing us the information that goes in that database. Right? It's a very good visualization tool. It's an analysis tool as well. We can actually go in after the fact and identify what did go wrong with the system. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the situational awareness tool is, is critical. One of the things that during Sandy that, uh, and it's not an electricity issue, but it was fuel availability, right? So we have to incorporate the interdependencies of, of fuel, communications, electricity, all in this analytic tool. And these are things we're pursuing right now uh, and using Eagle Eye as our, as our base to do that with. Uh, I know the, uh, the paper also addressed, as you've seen, you know, using uh, renewable energy for long-term outages. Uh, and in some communities during Sandy, they were actually talking about that. Hoboken was an example. Um, you know, they had four substations go out that service Hoboken. All four were flooded. They needed to be rebuilt. Uh, and wouldn't you know that uh, the, one of the last ones that got built was the one that supported the housing area. So, uh, so if you can imagine a, a large area of low-income housing without power in these high-rise apartment buildings, it was not a pretty scene, right? And the mayor of Hoboken uh, was expressing, what are some things we can do? You know, are there renewable energies that could be put on the roof, for example, and just provide enough power for emergency lighting in these buildings? Maybe just enough power for people to charge their cell phones recognizing you don't want to put a bunch of 110 outlets up there because they'll t plug in their TV sets and, and, and everything else, but you can put USB ports in some of these charging stations in these apartment buildings using renewable energy uh, for some of these long-term outages. So there are mayors out there in communities that are looking at whatever options are available for them to sustain some of these long-term outages, right? Um, but technology is not always the answer. Uh, certainly changes in tactics and for the military types, tactics, techniques, and procedures. Uh, the same were alive and well in the utility industry. Uh, one thing that was very uh, kind of strange, because we talk about critical nodes, critical assets all the time, and we're very, it's, it's part of our, our vernacular, but uh, it's not to these communities. And when they sustained this damage, they had no idea what was important for them. They didn't have, they had no idea what substations service the water treatment facilities or the hospitals or their high-rise apartment buildings, right? And, and so one of the issues that we're working on right now is working with these communities to help identify, number one, what are those critical nodes and critical loads in your communities, right? And if you've got 10 critical assets and you've got 10 substations feeding your system, your, your, your city, and you've got a critical asset tied to each one of those substations, why not merge those critical assets onto three substations? You've done a couple things. You've now prioritized your substations so you know which ones you need to rebuild first. Or you've identified those substations that truly need to be hardened. You can't afford to harden all of them. But if you can tie the most critical nodes to, those, to a certain number of those substations, you can then invest some money to harden and, 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 and build up the berms and the walls and the flood walls and so on and so forth to protect some of these substations. So these are some of the things that we're working with. And then reconfiguring the local distribution grid uh, to accommodate that. Uh, so as we look ahead, solutions are really determined by where you sit, right? If you're a legislator, your solution is to legislate. If you're a regulator, your solution is to regulate. Uh, if you're in the federal government like I am, you gotta trust and cooperate, right? So uh, we're in the cooperation mode. And so we do that based on our partnerships with industry. Um, the all hazards approach uh, to what we do is important. Uh, we just can't uh, prepare for bad weather. We have to prepare for, for all those other bad things that could happen to our infrastructure. Um, and it starts with uh, education and information sharing both between the government and industry, and then between the government and industry as a partner and communicating that uh, to the customers. 
so they are be, they'll be better prepared, um, allowing them to know what their role is in the restoration process, because customers do have a role in the restoration process, and also to provide realistic expectations for when they can expect their power back on. So uh, I look forward to your questions, and uh, that concludes my, my opening comments. Thank you, Bill. Um, as I anticipated, it would be a good policy perspective from the federal government point of view. Let's turn it over to Steve, who, uh, as a member of the faculty and research in the um, Northeastern as well as the University of Pennsylvania, give us your perspective, Steve. Sure. Th th thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And, and what I'd like to maybe focus on with my comments about is how I think the, uh, uh, the energy sector and electrical power sector in particular has helped us to start to think more broadly about this homeland security imperative, to move away from essentially a protection approach to one that embraces this concept of resilience, and a little bit of the work that we're doing to help give that some more definition. I was very pleased, as Bill uh, Bryan just mentioned, that you know, the President just came out uh, on the 12th of February with a new uh, Presidential Policy Directive 21 for critical infrastructure security and resilience, and it replaces the Bush era HSPD-8, which was about critical infrastructure protection. And what is, at its core, I think, is what we're starting to realize is what we should be securing in protecting is not, asset, is not assets, but is the critical function that those assets provide. And then when you start looking at critical function and how to safeguard it, there are a whole range of risks that are not just uh, man-made malicious intent risks that can disrupt those functions. And so we should want to look across that continuum for opportunities uh, to address them. So the systems can better withstand uh, the, the likely risk and be able to adapt to them and be able to nimbly respond and recover from them. And that's something I've been pushing for a while, and it's this concept of resilience. Uh, in 2007, I was working on a book with the, with the working title was Rebuilding a Resilient Nation. Uh, Random House said there's no damn way they could sell any books called Rebuilding a Resilient Nation. Uh, so they called it The Edge of Disaster. Uh, orange and black cover and, you know, sort of playing that fear piece, I guess, element here. But and a good bit of the, my effort increasingly is how do we embrace, in fact, this capacity to roll with punches instead of uh, essentially turn ourselves in knots trying to prevent every bad thing from happening, which I sense is realistic, not affordable, not sustainable. And, and the light bulb literally for me went on when they went off for the uh, eastern seaboard in the heartland of our country in August 2003. I was here in Washington, actually in Reston, Virginia, in a cab on my way back to the uh, airport uh, to fly on the shuttle to New York, where I was at the time, the Council of Farm Relations. And happily, the cab driver had the radio on, and I uh, heard the grid was going down. I know enough about the grid at the time to go, this isn't going to get fixed very quick. Uh, so uh, I was on the phone to the Hertz Rental Agency. I told the cab driver, don't stop at the uh, U.S. Air Shuttle. Take me right to the rental agency desk. When I got there, I had my car, there was a tidal wave of people who showed up behind me. Uh, I drove up because my home is in Connecticut, and I'll never forget driving across the George Washington Bridge that evening going, oh, this is how the Dutch saw this place. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. A eerie thing to see uh, the lights out on, uh, on a global city like New York. Um, but, you know, of course that was, we didn't know initially what caused it here, but it turned out to be, you know, the tree and the ricochet effect and so forth. But it got me thinking, what if we knew that there was a Al-Qaeda, we unearthed in a cave somewhere in Afghanistan, that Al-Qaeda was interested in targeting distribution, uh, or transmission towers. You know, and highly secret notes, we, we, we find this, and now, oh my God, we got to tell the utilities about this. Well, who do we tell? Well, it's classified. Well, maybe we have to tell the chief security officer, okay, who we given a clearance, so that made some progress, who of course can't tell how we got the information or the details information because it's secure. And what would we have been told them to do with it? Okay, we have Al-Qaeda who's going to interested in going after transmission towers. What was the utility supposed to do? Mobilize an army of utility workers to guard each one? Or call out the National Guard? I mean, you know, how would you protect it? And what would you be protecting? The real issue was not that we had a single failure of a transmission line, it was what it caused to the rest of the grid, and it turned out the grid was more fragile than people had presumed. And very importantly, because it was not a terrorist incident, we were able to have a very open and inclusive process to try to figure out what happened and what we could do better to make it more resilient going forward, including things like I'm glad you're all seating. We can brought the Canadians in the room and talk about what to do, since they share the problem. What, imagine again, it was a security problem. 
we couldn't tell the Canadians about the utility. Well, I'm up in Boston here, and we get a lot of our juice from Hydro-Quebec. Okay, so if we're talking about protecting the grid, you, I want you to go talk to the folks up there in Quebec, but, oh, well, geez, I don't have clearances. You know, how do we... So part of our problem here with the protection focus is that it almost misdirects our attention. It leads us to almost to close off conversations that are really get at the real issue, which is what's the problem, what's the vulnerability, what's the consequences, and how do we sort of engineer solutions going forward? So, you know, a bit with that concept, let, let's try to flesh this out and how I think, and this very paper very importantly helps us in this thinking as well. What we begin with is not, I, I argue here, and I think there's some growing momentum to this, we need to throw out a model that I'm afraid has almost been completely institutionalized in the homeland security space, which is built around a probabilistic threat-based approach to dealing with what priorities we assign with regard to critical infrastructure. You know, it works in this very linear fashion, right? Risk equals threat times vulnerability times consequence. And it moves in that direction. You're first gonna tell me there's a threat, then I will look at the infrastructure to see if it's vulnerable, then I will assess whether it's consequential, and if that's all bad, right, three lemons, then that's a priority. And if I don't have threat information, well, geez, we shouldn't inconvenience anybody to do it. You know, you, the whole crux of it is built around lousy intelligence about the threat. Well, what's the problem with this? Two really very straightforward ones. First, hard to get good intelligence, timely enough, you know, to deal with this. And especially a problem when talking about infrastructure, which takes years to build and is going to be around for decades, like we're talking about these transformers. So your window of opportunity to think about safeguards isn't when you get the threat warning. That's usually long gone. The time to think about how to safeguard that asset would have been when you built the damn thing and when you're doing maintenance and upgrades and all the rest of it here. So the whole idea that the trigger for dealing with critical infrastructure protection should be around threat. You have to show me conclusively to somebody out there who's intending to actually carry out this attack before we do something. It makes no sense for critical infrastructure. Right? So that's the practical. But it also sort of gets at this, this core issue of that the, the threat ultimately is a problem if we lose function. And we need to think about how to assure continuity of function. And there are a lot more ways in which that happens than just relying on man-made threat. And so if that's the case, we need to invert the whole paradigm. My argument is you start first by saying, what's the critical function? What's the critical function? What's the critical need for our society? All right, now, it turns out, as the President rightly noted here, is the most critical of our infrastructures turns out to be power, because energy, because you don't have that, none of the rest of them work. So let's prioritize. This, is, again, was a problem with this 18-sector approach. It's like each one is equal somehow, and you know, we just sort of whack-a-mole do each one, and somehow, collectively, we've got the nation secure. Well, actually, no, some are more important than others. Why? Because there's more interdependency with one than the other, so let's start looking at that. First. So the starting our point is to say, well, what are the critical functions? Well, we need energy, we need mobility, we need communications, great. Part two, map and model the system, the network, the infrastructure that provides you that function. And if you do that, you'll realize things like, okay, we need energy here in the Northeast, of where I'm up here in Boston, where does it come from? Oh, Hydro-Quebec, oh, I better go talk to the Canadians. Because we've mapped and modeled, we now, and, and so the, the other thing we need to do, map and model, we need to, Look at its components, we look at its boundaries, okay, and realize in some cases those boundaries don't fit in jurisdictions, states, and so forth. And lastly, we look at its governance. Who are the stakeholders who are involved with it? Because I can come up with very elegant solutions here in Washington or you know, somewhere else, and, but if I don't actually know who the stakeholders are who have the levers of power, I'm not going to get to where I need to go. So we start with what's the capable function, and then we say uh, that, what's, that we want to safeguard. What's the system network? that provides that function, breaking that around components, boundaries, governance, and then we go, what would disturb it? If it's critical, we should be interested in looking at the whole menu. What's really important for our security and prosperity is the continuity of that critical function. So what would disturb it? Mother Nature could disturb it. Not maintaining could disturb it. And bad people doing bad things. We'd inventory across that of what could disturb it, but key to the enterprise here is test it to the worst case. You've got to balance some probability to that, but we have to put it under real stress in order to say, okay, you're willing to live with those consequences? Because if those consequences look really bad when we start to see these interdependencies, that will inform now the solution set. So having ideally mapped what it is that the disturbances are, we will now then take it to the next step, which is to say, 
What's the menu of things we want to do to safeguard the critical function against this disruptive risk? What can we do in advance of the event to mitigate it, to make it withstand? Do we make it robust, harden it? Do we go for redundancy? You know, what are the protocols that we need to have in place to manage the reliability of it? And then during, what do we do to ideally have a surgical response, not a very clumsy one, and then recovery? How do we get it back up if we've lost it, particularly if it's an unknown shock? But we put ourselves through that whole menu of left to right to figure out what the best solutions are in order to basically get to a point where then the system is, quote, resilient. Now I'm going to come back full circle. If a system is resilient, by definition, we're going to drive down threat and risk. Why is that? Because the only way I can make a system resilient is make it less vulnerable to disruption and less consequential should something happen. That gets at the core of what threat is, right? Threat is a combination of capability and intent. Right, the classic formulation. The, the French have nuclear weapons. We're not losing sleep, most of us, I don't think, at night that the French could use them against us. They don't have intent. We have nutcases who think about Armageddon every day, but they can't get out of their houses. They have intent with no capability. It's when we merge the two that we have a threat. Well, think about this for critical infrastructure resilience, what we're achieving by making it less vulnerable and less consequential. I would need more capability to overcome the safeguards you have in place. And if I hit it, it's a fizzle, not a big bang. I drive down intent. So I actually achieve the goal of safeguarding the critical infrastructure by making it less vulnerable, more consequential, i.e. more resilient, versus protecting it from the classic look who the bad guys are and develop a strategy to deal with the bad guy. That's the big shift. So just a couple of final things, thoughts here relative to bring this to the, to the applied part here of the, of the grid. Uh, I had some moment to think about uh, the problem of power outages because I live in Connecticut, formerly thought to be in a first world country, but uh, presently uh, operating with four multi-day outages uh, uh, in the last two years. Uh, in, in my neighborhood, just most recently with the blizzard, 80% of us went down again without power. Now I have to practice what I preach. I have my generator and I have my red jugs and I'm ready to go. But um, a couple of things are going on here. When we think about resilience in terms of the capacity to withstand, that's clearly, in this case, it's a maintenance issue. We get too many trees that are higher than the lines, guarantee when the wind blows, the tree's gonna come down. So we have to think about that investment. Not bad guys doing bad things, trees, okay? So we gotta think through that menu of options if that's the hazard that's gonna rest of the year. Basic idea I have though, in speeding up recovery, because your focus, if you're thinking about making it resilient, is bouncing it back. Amazingly, and quite impressively, we flew in power utility crews from Anaheim, California, to and C C C C C C to uh, uh, the East Coast to help us restore, and it was certainly great to see those utility crews here. But, but I got another idea, okay? One thing that stalls us out in the first three or four days for these mass outages is basically the damage assessment. The issue is we have wires down, we don't know if they're alive or dead, we can't clear the roads until the lines are clear, so what do you do? Well, I hired one, and I expect every other town has them. I have these people that are known as licensed electricians, okay? And I bet as one of their skill sets, they know how to identify whether or not there is live power or not coming out of a line. And I could imagine pre-deputizing and, you know, even credentialing if need be them to be able to go out in the immediate aftermath, and these are small businesses, so we could even potentially pay them to play this role, to probably cut three or four days on the recovery for these mass outages by just going out and saying, yep, this one's live, this one's dead, and feed into the utilities. So utility crews can do the real heavy lifting stuff of fixing the transformers and the flooded substations and the transmission lines or other problems that are there. And they can also be there for the last mile, which is getting to the house and take care of those kinds of responsibilities. If we're thinking about resilience, we're thinking about those kinds of solutions of basically how do we, it's critical, we want to recover it as quickly as possible. What can we do? What's the menu of options to kind of pull all that all together? Uh, also very critically, the last is the need, when these things happen, we can't just put Humpty Dumpty back together again. I mean, we're about to drop $60 billion in the, in the greater New York area, and we're hearing the right things from the president, the right things from people like Governor Cuomo and Governor Christie and, and Mayor Bloomberg saying, okay, we can't put it back, but the pressure is on to put it back just the way you found it. And this is, again, like putting Humpty Dumpty back, teetering on the wall, okay, good. 
These are so rare and unknowable, we can't actually plan for them. This is nonsense. So going forward, every time we have a disaster and we're going to put money into the system, let's make sure we spend it wisely to make that system more resilient. We get a threefer. We get the economic value. We can probably make it greener and more efficient. And we also ultimately improve our security by making it less vulnerable and consequential, i.e., driving down the risk of somebody we want to target. Thanks wow. very much. Thank you. Steve, you underscore the reason we wanted to have this panel. It's a very healthy uh, forum to have these public discussions. Um, this is almost the quiet vulnerability because not people, people think about it until you've lost your power in your kitchen. Right? This is a much more complex problem. So um, in, in the spirit of what we can do to mitigate this, um, our last presenter is um, Dr. Jeff Mazur, and he's going to focus on one of the alternatives in photovoltaic uh, battery technology. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jeff Mazur. I'd like to uh, spend a few minutes discussing this third issue that uh, Captain Hurley mentioned in uh, the, rec the three recommendations that are being considered here, namely uh, amelioration of long-term outages uh, by various technologies, and in particular uh, photovoltaic solar cell technology. Uh, by, I, I want to clarify that uh, by long-term outages, uh, we're talking about something that's more than two weeks in length. So the first thing that comes to mind with any kind of outage is that you have a, a big supply of uh, uh, diesel fuel or gasoline for uh, a, a, a gas gen set or, or something like that. But you can see that uh, for various kinds of emergency situations, whether they're man-made terrorist or or uh, natural uh, disasters like Katrina, uh, this whole business of transporting fuel and operating uh, that type of equipment uh, uh, for long periods of time becomes very problematic. So we look towards renewables, and, and that's, uh, th that's exactly what uh, th the issue is here. So uh, these are the things I'm going to go over very quickly. I'll just tell you about uh, uh, PV and show you the applicability of uh, photovoltaics to the amelioration of long-term outages, uh, particularly in the context of uh, Department of Defense installations and uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, photovoltaic technology uh, was invented, uh, well, solar cells uh, were invented around 1953-54 at Bell Telephone Labs, and for a few years they were just scientific curiosities. They were uh, low efficiency uh, uh, silicon devices. Uh, in the early 60s, uh, people realized that they could be used for outer space power supplies. It wasn't until, because of their uh, great expense, uh, it wasn't until the, uh, well into the uh, 70s that they were starting to be used for premium power, very expensive power in uh, standalone uh, battery-based uh, systems uh, almost entirely in developing countries. But then around the end of, of the 90s, the production price came down so much and the efficiency went up so much that uh, they started to be deployed in a grid-tied uh, 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 environment in developed countries. And, and these days, almost all uh, photovoltaics uh, uh, goes in as uh, battery-free grid-tied in developing countries. Even though the technology was uh, developed at uh, Bell Labs uh, here in the United States, uh, most photovoltaic technology, most solar cells, most uh, photovoltaic modules are uh, made offshore, and uh, uh, China has well over 50 percent of the market. Uh, you can see that there's quite a bit being deployed now, uh, over 67 gigawatts. To give you an idea how much that is, the PEPCO, what used to be the PEPCO generating plant, I think it was the PEPCO generating plant just south of National Airport, uh, which you've probably seen if you're flying in from the south, uh, of National Airport, was, was rated at about 460 megawatts. So 67 gigawatts would be, uh, I don't know, 140 or, uh, 140 or so of those plants. So a good bit of photovoltaics is already deployed. Uh, most of it in the form of uh, battery-free, grid-tied uh, environments uh, to, to, to feed into the commercial power grid. Here you can see the growth of photovoltaic technology uh, starting around uh, 2001 or 2002 or so. It really started to grow quickly. Uh, for the last, uh, for the 10 years from 2000 to 2010, the growth averaged over 40 percent a year in terms of megawatts shipped. Um, uh, and 
in particular, uh, in 2011 and, and uh, uh, 2010, there was very there was a continued strong growth of, of this technology. Uh, here are some large photovoltaic arrays in the United States. Uh, in Europe, there are even larger arrays. There are some arrays over 25 megawatts. And in uh, the PRC, the Chinese government is in the process of installing uh, a two gigawatt, that's 2,000 megawatt array at Ordis City in uh, northeast China near uh, Urumqi. Uh, but there are, there are also several large arrays in the United States. And of course, many, many, many arrays uh, on the order of a few gig of a few kilowatts on the rooftops of homes and of buildings, but here uh, here are some uh, utility scale arrays. Uh, all of these arrays are grid tied, and they all exist uh, for the purpose of lowering energy bills. Uh, in particular, notice the array. Uh, uh, one array is uh, where are the arrays? That's a good question. Uh, 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 one, of the, one of the arrays is at the uh, San Jose International Airport in the lower left, in case you can't read the captions. Uh, the one on the top is in uh, Boulder, uh, and the one on the lower right is two megawatts at uh, Fort Carson, uh, U.S. Army. Uh, photovoltaics can be made and is made uh, highly robust. This is an interesting photograph I found. I'm not sure where I found it, somewhere on the internet. But this was taken uh, right after uh, Superstorm Sandy uh, a few months ago, and you can see a lot of homes are washed out. Uh, but interestingly, if you look right in the middle of that photograph, you can see a PV array, photovoltaic array, uh, looks to me like it's about 12 modules, on the roof of a home. It's securely uh, bolted down on rails to that home. That's usually the way they do it, uh, offset from the roof by a few inches. And uh, it went through the storm very well. So this is a very robust, tough technology. Usually the modules are warranted for 80% uh, max rated power after 25 years. But, uh, but I'll bet you that the, uh, the silicon technology, which is the, uh, still the dominant form of photovoltaics and will be for years to come, uh, will probably provide 80% max rated power after 50 years. Uh, these are all uh, grid tied, that is uh, the uh, uh, direct current that the uh, uh, solar cells make is inverted into alternating current and then synchronized into the commercial power grid. So uh, the homeowner or the business owner or uh, Fort Carson uh, Army base is not operating directly off the cells but rather uh, off, uh, um, operating off of the grid and at the same time selling power back into the grid so that uh, you have a net meter. It uh, measures power in both directions and the owner uh, of, of the building is, is charged the, uh, uh, the net amount used and given a credit if there's something left over uh, for the next month. Uh, moving right along here, uh, photovoltaics is, is uh, uh, very oriented towards uh, long-term outages. Uh, typically it would be deployed in a grid tied uh, 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 set up, uh, and as I said, where uh, you're always feeding power into the power grid, uh, but if the grid goes down, the system immediately uh, recognizes this, uh, disconnects the system from the grid so that you don't accidentally electrocute any technicians working on the lines, and then you operate in a completely uh, autonomous off-grid manner. Uh, when you operate, as I notice, as I note in the uh, uh, second bullet, uh, uh, this has to be a battery-based environment. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, the appliances and electronic equipment, communicom equipment, which is being powered by the photovoltaics, requires a constant voltage. So uh, whenever you have an off-grid system of any technology, it doesn't have to be photovoltaics, any off-grid technology has to be interfaced to a battery before the power reaches the endpoint so as to maintain a constant voltage. So uh, on the one hand, you're charging the batteries, and on the other hand, you're operating off the batteries. Uh, DO, DOD has a mandate for renewables, in particular uh, uh, the Defense Authorization Act of 2007 uh, targeted 25% uh, deployment on, uh, on uh, uh, DOD facilities by the year uh, 2025. More recently, the uh, DOD Strategic Sustainability Performance Plan of 2011 
uh, commits DOD to 20% uh, renewables, uh, not necessarily photovoltaics, but to be sure photovoltaics will be a large fraction of it uh, by the year uh, 2020. So DOD is heavily invested and has been for a number of years now into renewables, uh, particularly photovoltaics. Here are some examples of uh, PV deployments on uh, 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 military sites. Uh, uh, the deployment on the left is 14 megawatts uh, uh, single axis tracking. That is, it tracks the sun in one axis, not two axes. Uh, it's about 14 megawatts at uh, uh, Nevis uh, uh, Air Force Base. Uh, the at Nellis Air Force Base, excuse me, uh, that's in Nevada. The one on the right is uh, in the process of being built. That's uh, over 14 megawatts, and that will be at uh, Montaigne Air Force Base in Arizona. Again, these are grid tied for the purposes of lowering the energy bill. The base operates off of the grid uh, and gets a, a credit a, a for uh, the power that's sold back into the grid. If batteries were Thank you. If, if batteries were uh, uh, supplied, these could be completely off-grid autonomous installations if need be. I don't, I don't think they've been uh, built that way, but they could be. Uh, here are some examples of, aut of purely autonomous PV installations that are used for critical infrastructure. These include uh, uh, microwave repeaters, uh, radio frequency repeaters on mountaintops in uh, remote areas. Uh, uh, the one on the right is at uh, is a, uh, a few kilowatts at uh, Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico for remote communications. Uh, here are some more examples: uh, a microwave repeater. Uh, notice the towable array on the right. Uh, I wanted to include the uh, bottom photograph. Uh, this is very interesting. This is a thin film array. It's copernium gallium diselenide or SIGS, C I G S. Uh, in a foldable array, it's man portable, backpack carried, that can be used for uh, recharging radio batteries in the field. But let me just spend uh, uh, two minutes telling you about advanced energy storage. Uh, I'm with the Smart Grid program at NIST, and uh, I can tell you that uh, energy storage will be a very big part of Smart Grid because as Smart Grid develops, renewables will uh, become a, a bigger and bigger part, uh, PV and, and wind and other renewables. And and at least for PV and wind, you have a considerable amount of variability. And consequently, you have to have a lot of storage when you have a lot of renewables. I'm not talking about a few rooftop arrays here and there in the neighborhood. I'm talking about many, many thousands of, of rooftop arrays and also some big utility scale arrays. You have to have storage to accommodate that. Uh, and in particular, in, as I point out here, battery storage in order to level out the, uh, the supply with the demand. So uh, uh, there's a lot of work going into advanced energy storage, particularly by uh, ARPA-E uh, at the Department of Energy. Uh, batteries have uh, usually been uh, uh, some version of uh, lead acid because they're highly reliable uh, and they're relatively cheap and they, they can be uh, uh, they can survive many, many recharge cycles, but they tend to have low energy density. Uh, so a number of uh, alternatives have, are being researched right now, in particular various versions of lithium ion batteries that have high energy density, uh, sodium sulfur batteries that have high energy density, but they're high temperature, so those are used for immobile uh, large deployments. Uh, as I said, ARPA-E is uh, putting a lot of work into this, uh, not, not just for uh, support of the grid, uh, but also uh, for electric vehicles. Uh, here are some uh, uh, other uh, energy storage options that are being uh, investigated. Uh, in particular, I point out to you fuel cells. Fuel cells are actually becoming quite popular in large sizes. Uh, uh, we've all heard about uh, the, the fuel cells at, at Google, for example. Uh, uh, this is quite a developed technology, and I think we'll see that as the price comes down, fuel cells will be, uh, become more and more significant. So here are my conclusions. Uh, first of all, photovoltaics is a mature, robust technology, uh, and, and it's uh, uh, quite well suited for supporting uh, critical infrastructure during uh, long-term outages. Uh, DOD and telecom companies have already started deploying this. Uh, DOD does have a mandate for renewables, but unfortunately, uh, telecoms do not have a mandate yet 
for uh, supporting long-term outages. Most of the uh, uh, over 200,000 uh, cell phone base sites in the United States have several hours of battery backup, but certainly that will not get us through a long-term outage of more than two weeks. And unfortunately, there's no mandate for that, at least uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, Off-grid PV operation requires batteries, as I said, uh, for uh, constant voltage support to equipment. Uh, but while the uh, uh, array is on the grid, it's selling power back into the grid, and so that helps to pay for the whole cost of the system, including the batteries. Uh, and uh, I would point out that uh, uh, the amortized cost of photovoltaics now is uh, below 15 cents per kilowatt hour, so it's becoming quite competitive. Uh, thanks. So it's a classic story of good news, bad news. We have challenges, we have vulnerabilities, but what we wanted to demonstrate in the panel is the public policy issues are maturing. Uh, we've got some time to go before it's there yet. And the new technology is there as well. Um, we're